because their business were, at that time, it was optical communication. Uh, their business was telecommunication. And they need to keep moving the technology forward. Otherwise, they lose the market. So at that time, the focus was producing lasers to operate in the optical range for telecommunication around 1.5 microns in wavelength. Lasers and detectors. And we were producing very small, very tiny layers of semiconductors. Like one atom, one atom layer. And some wires which were one atom high and six atom wide. That was my work there. That's why they want me to stay there. They, want, they don't want to take a risk. This, you know, this topic, this research, running out from Bell Labs. How to keep the research there? Let's keep the guy here. But it didn't work. And then, when I set up my research group in Brazil, I look around myself and then I say, okay, I need to find partners. The first partner I found was in the Institute of Biology. And then we start doing nanotoxicity as early as 1995. Nobody was talking about nanotoxicity <coughs> at that time. We published the first papers on nanotoxicity of magnetic nanoparticles and magnetic nanostructures. And so comes nanobiomaterials and some others. You know, some smaller side, sideway research. So that's my experience. Next. Then, then, happened so many things. Invitations to go, like here. Next. Like this one. This is the letter of invitation I got from here. Okay? Now, after this presentation, I should start my first lecture. Oh. Where is the keyboard? Is it the keyboard? Oh, I get back. Should be some. It, it is a locker. Oh, okay. Yeah, we can close this guy. Yeah, close this. And now this, just close this. Wow, where is my. Where is the file? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. Uh, no, 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 no. Yeah, this one. Right. This. This is right. Okay. This is forward. Forward. Okay. 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 Thank you. So I collected uh, to deliver to you six lectures and three tutorials. This is my side. Uh, my colleagues will deliver too some lectures and maybe, I don't know, uh, tutorials. But my side will be six lectures and three tutorials. And this is the first lecture. Lectures are supposed to run by about one hour. I will try to cover because it is already a little bit late. And but you guys took some hmm, some food huh, in the aisle. So this is our first lecture: magnetization. Roughly, roughly, I'm trying to cover this proposal. 
So I'll talk a little bit about instrumentation, phase transition, which is typical. Uh, some hysteresis curves, zero field cooled and field cooled, and along my presentation, I will show you some fittings of the data. Most of my presentations here, either in lectures or tutorials, will be connected to nanomaterials. And among them, mostly magnetic nanomaterials. I should present something about semiconductor nanomaterials too, but roughly they are connected. Okay. So, what is magnetization? Uh, it's not a very complicated idea. Let's say you have a piece of your sample, and you have a side. It could be just one atom or a molecule, but then you have unpaired spin. That unpaired spin gives you a little magnetic moment. Okay? Magnetization. You can find it if you manage to sum all those small guys. The whole sample. See, it is a vector. Some cases you have uh, those small magnetic moments on sides of your sample, but maybe they are aligned in a way they cancel each other. Though they are magnetic, like anti-ferromagnetic material. When you sample them, all your sample, actually the net magnetization if you measure like this, will be zero. And that happens much better in bulk materials. When you take your material and you squeeze it down in the nano size scale, many things happen, especially at the surface. In the core, in the bulk of nanomaterials, it's not a big change, but at the surface, there is a big change. And then, though, though your bulk material would be antiferromagnetic, maybe when you squeeze it down to the non-scale, it will not be completely antiferromagnetic. Why? Because these spins at the surface they are so unhappy. You know why? They look inside and they see other spins looking alike. But they, when they look outside, they see nothing. They are very much frustrated. And this, the spins at the surface, they don't align perfectly antiferromagnetic. So, it may happen, if your material is antiferromagnetic in the book, maybe in a small size, and also depends on the shape, this, the, you know, the net magnetization maybe is not perfectly zero, okay? Because the spin at the surface, they are, you know, in trouble. The technical word is spins at the surface, they have no translational symmetry anymore. Look inside, they do. Looking out, outside, they don't. Okay? So, this is the way you sample magnetization. And here it's a very you know, simple sketch how you can measure this one. Look at this. Your sample is here. These are the poles of one magnet. Typically, you know, 
measurement of magnetization use this configuration. You take your sample and put in a magnet. And then there are different ways. Huh? For instance, the poles here of your magnet could be flat. And then the field lines will be all parallel, so the field is uniform. But you can also build the poles here not to be flat. You can change huh? in your magnet. You just put some poles, pieces, poles there, which are not flat. So if the pieces, pole of your magnet are flat, like this, then the field is all parallel and uniform, except at the border. Surface and border is always trouble. But if you shape your poles in a different way, not this way, but this way, for instance, it was like this. You don't want like this anymore. You want something a little bit different, like this. Ah, now the field is not parallel anymore. There is a gradient of magnetic field here. This is very important for some techniques. OK, let's see it. This is one of the most successful uh, let's say, a uh, technical approach to measure magnetization. It's called vibration, vibrating sample magnetometer. It was invented by Simon Fonner. Oh, it's so bad. But here is his original paper. Let me see which year. It's 1950-something. Yeah, this paper is Review of Scientific Instrument, July 1954. July 1954, I was a baby. Six months old baby. Two years ago, Simon Fulmer published a nice paper in Physical Review Letters. Can you believe this man is still working? Nice paper. OK, so uh, to understand how it works, see, I wrote here the Maxwell's equation. But I don't need all of them to explain how this system works. I just need this one. If you have, if you make your magnetic field change with time, you have a chance to create a current right that's all we need to make this instrument work hmm? look at that how smart simon was he made a system like this this is the head of the magnetometer and there is a stick and this stick just vibrate like this that's where the name comes from <coughs> and then he just attached to the end of that tip the sample and use a uniform magnet field. Okay? So the sample is magnetic. And when you apply the external field, your sample, the magnetic moment of your sample aligns with the external field. Okay, so your sample is under magnetic field and it is magnetic. You apply the field here, your sample here, the moment, the magnetic moment of the sample aligns with the field. And then this sample is vibrating like that. Okay, so the magnetic moment of the sample is moving as a function of time. It is all you need to fulfill this Maxwell's equation. And then what you do? You put some 
coil around here, detecting coils. Just a coil. For A, there are different configurations for that one. So the magnet moment of your sample just move near the coils and change the magnetic flux in the coils periodically. And then there is a current in the coils. You can measure that current. That current is scales with the magnetic moment of your sample. That's the way to measure magnetization. And you can increase, you can sweep the external field. The more you increase the field, the higher is the magnetization of your sample. And as it moves, the higher the, the current in the coil, in the detector coil. So it is scales with the magnetization of your sample. And, if you will, you can draw inside a cryostat and measure this as a function of temperature, right? How big this guy is? This is a, a technical, you know, a detail of the head. But this head, typically, it is commercial. Because Simon made all several patents out from this. The head is maybe is a cylinder, typically. Maybe this size in radio, in diameter, and this size in height. And so that head keeps outside the magnet. And then you have, you know, a sticker more than one meter long. And your sample is right there at the end, at the tip. Okay? So you can put a, a, a cryostat down there, no problem. Okay. And this is one of my publications, also in review of scientific instruments. Years later, you can see March 1985, when we made, we made at that time, we had no money to afford and buy a commercial VSM. But I want to have one. What you do? Go to the machinery shop and make yours. But I want to make something small, not that big guy. I want to make something which is this size in diameter and this size in length. That's why I call it micro. You can see here micro vibration sample magnet. And everything goes inside the magnet. Of course, you have to make your material not magnetic, like aluminum or acrylic, you know or Teflon. We did it. So here is the little guy. Maybe if you have time later on, you will receive this file and then you can check okay, the publication. Uh, we made this little guy uh, maybe 10 centimeters long and maybe about 4 centimeters in diameter. So you can fit it on your, on your magnet easily. So, but it was a little bit different. We had the coil here, detecting coils here. Oh, oh act, not detecting, generating coils here. <laughs> this is to modulate uh, the field. We apply the external field because this guy is inside the magnet. And then we apply AC field here. So in the sample, which is here, you have the applied external field and the modulating field. Which means, if, you are mod if your sample is magnetic, and if you are modulating the field, your sample move. <laughs> now, you make the field to move your sample. It's just the opposite. And now, 
how you pick up the signal? Okay, we made it here is a chamber, air chamber. And everything is connected. When this stick move, there is a flat, a flat, uh, a sort of a, a flat screen over there, flexible. And the stick is connected to the flat foil there. When it moves, it changes the pressure inside the cell, right? It's like a sound. And here there is a microphone. So, the signal in the microphone, intensity of the signal scales with the magnetic moment of your sample. That's what we did. This work was done, it, it, it was done, I was just in the second year of my PhD. But this is not my thesis. <laughs> it was something I did for fun, maybe. I don't know. My thesis was about phase transition in uh, single crystals using EPR. A little bit far from this. Okay, but I was having fun because I could measure the magnetization of magnet nanoparticles I had worked in my master thesis and I had no commercial magnetometer to, to measure that so we built this one okay huh? oh you have to calibrate you can move it you know uh, this guy is mounted in a positioner. You can move up and down and sideways and put some, you know, reference material there like nickel. Then you can set on the settle point, which is very important, of course. And this is a measure. Look, this is magnetization versus temperature. In the sample, I work in my master thesis, which, is, which are magnet nanoparticles. And see, we measure the magnetization increasing the applied external field. And we saw some kinks here. Actually, those kinks are the blocking temperature. And you see two kinks because the sample had a distribution a, a, a bimodal distribution of particles. I will show you the TEM. Wow. I'll show you later on the TF. Okay, so VSM is a very standard technique to measure magnetization. Very standard. Of course, these days you, you can use squid, but still people are using VSM. Years later, I managed to buy a commercial VSM, 1997. Hmm? It cost me 300,000 US dollars. High, so then I had a nice, you know, nice toy to play. But 1996, actually, it was more than one decade after <laughs> my little toy, homemade little toy. So, here is another one to measure. It's called balance. Because it, it, it measures the weight, actually. You have, you have to have a balance, a scale. This is called Faraday, Faraday approach. So how it works, actually, it works like this. First, you don't have uniform field. It's no uniform field, which is a gradient of magnetic field. And if your sample is magnetic, you can, this gradient of magnetic field, you can see here, this gradient of magnetic field scales with the force applied in your sample, okay? So also the force scales with the susceptibility of the material. 
and of course the amount of material you have inside your sample holder that's the volume so that's the principle to work on this technique you put your sample over there apply the external field the more the higher the field or the higher the gradient of the field the higher the force and then you can measure see this picture here shows you the sample has a weight you can see m times g plus there is a force magnetic force against and this sample is connected to a very sensitive scale you can calibrate your system and then you can measure magnetization because you calibrate the magnetization versus your scale hmm? the mass measured by your scale you can calibrate it okay this is another technique very standard too and you can see how it looks like in real you know that's a real one you can see the magnet here and the scale is connected over there and this is a typical data you can take from magnet nanoparticles see magnetization versus temperature goes like that looking like a phase transition second order phase transition typically these curves typically they are described by a, a function typically like this you know the magnetization goes like the saturation magnetization 1 minus t over tc this is a critical exponent it depends on the dimensionality of your system you may have different values for better half or one-third well or something in between we don't understand completely okay but now the saturation magnetization also changes if you change the temperature people use an approximation called Bloch's law here is the Bloch's law that's the Bloch's law you can roughly approximate the saturation magnetization by one kind of 1.5 3 over 2 scaling law this is roughly it works in many cases okay now this is a second way to measure magnetization a squid is another way but the sensor in the squid is a different guy very sensitive very much because it is based on a superconductor uh, device which can sense magnetization as small as one single nanoparticle so these days you can measure the magnetization of one single five nanometers diameter nanoparticle hmm? who believed that 20 years ago nobody but it does very sensitive those guys this one those two standard techniques they don't they can they can measure a single nanopart but squid of course this kind of sensor to measure just one nanoparticle you cannot buy online hmm? you need to fabricate it by yourself and you might guess the huge facility you have to have be, you know, below this fabrication but people are managing to do it it's a question of money how much money you have you know in your budget then you can do it you know that's that's the way the Chinese are doing science money hmm? it works I can tell you now oh this is the, this was the first paper I published look at the TM I took this TM it was taken in a TM system that operates at 40 kilo electron volts see 
today people are operating in 300 kilo electron volt TM. It was so hard to get this picture at that time. And here you can see the particle size distribution. And at that time, nobody was talking about nano. I caught this in angstrom. It was angstrom. Hmm? So here is about uh, 100. Let me check on my screen. And then, and then this sample, I, I managed to fabricate the sample, and wow, well, I can read it. But the smallest is 110 angstroms, which is 11 nanometer, the biggest one. And the smallest one is about 5.5 nanometers, 55 angstroms. This was my first published paper, 1982. But I measure, as you can see here, I didn't measure magnetization using the magnetometer because I didn't have it. But I had most boys spectroscopy. This is typical most boys spectroscopy of iron, iron 57. And then this is a typical magnetic material. And you can measure magnetization. You can see the magnetization it scales with the internal field, which is a distance between this line and that line. And as you warm up your sample, this most power spectrum just collapses. OK? And that scales exactly with the magnetization. That's the internal field. So. In my master thesis, I did this. I measured the magnetization and look at the phase transition of these nanoparticles. And that is the transition curve. This is magnetization, reduced temperature, and then here is the magnetization as a function of temperature. And this is the linearization of this magnetization. How can you linearize this using this equation, actually? If you make it a power of 1 over beta, both sides, you just linearize it. But you can see that I managed to linearize in some sectors. Why? Because my sample had two kinds of nanoparticles. Hmm? So, and it has two blocking temperatures. Actually, it's a system that responds as a function of the size. This is nanoscience. What is the biggest outcome of nanoscience? Is the physical dependence of the size and shape. You can modulate the physical response of materials, changing size and shape. This is the biggest outcome of nanoscience. And that is why it allows you to make nanotechnology. We were doing this, but, well, nobody knew. I mean, nobody was talking about this new wave of science. And I remember right after this one, I wrote a paper <laughs> and the explanation of my data that I wrote there was that the tunneling of the magnetic moment, the editor wrote me back a letter saying, you're crazy. Magnetic tunneling? Hmm? Family of the magnet moment? What a crazy idea. Oh, I was in the center of Brazil. I was like that. So scared. I gave up of my idea. But I still have the letter. E 
years later, hmm, people start talking about tunneling of the magnet moment. It's a big topic today. Things happen like that. Okay, another way to measure magnetization using, of course, the VSM or squid or the Faraday balance is to look at the field dependence of the magnetization. If you look at that, then you get those hysteresis curves. Huh? Those are typical hysteresis curves. This is magnetization versus applied field. You keep the temperature constant, and then you run this cycle experiment. Then you change the temperature and run it again. Okay? So here, also, this is from magnet nanoparticles. And this is a uh, 5K. This was measured at 5K, and this was measured at 300K. And you can see that from this situation to that one is a big change. Hmm? The history just closes as you warm up your sample. Actually, what does the remanence, which is this magnetization, and the coercivity, which is this field, just shrinks in, moves to zero until no hysteresis is also observable in your sample. For magnet material, for nanomaterials, for magnet nanomaterials, it means when your M versus H curve shows no hysteresis, your sample is in the super paramagnetic state. That's super paramagnetism. Using this technique, see, the signature of superparamagnetism actually depends on the time scale of your technique. Hmm? If you check the hysteresis using this technique, and if you check it using most power, they go to superparamagnetism at different temperatures. Because the time of observation of those two techniques are quite different. This one, you know, typical, typical observation of this one is around milliseconds. And most voice spectroscopy, the time window of observation is nanoseconds. Orders of magnitude. Little difference. And then you can also extract from Mossbauer measurements. If you have field, hmm, you can extract the hysteresis curves. Nobody does it because it's so ugly. I mean, it's so difficult to do it. Hmm? But you can do it. And then you will see that if you take the same sample, measure in Mossbauer spectroscopy, and measure in VSM, the cycle, the hysteresis cycle, closes at different temperatures because the observation time of the techniques are different. Okay, look, this, this curve is very nice because as you increase the field, there is a point where the derivative of your hysteresis is zero. It means it saturates, okay? But if you look at this curve, it doesn't saturate. Look at that. Huh? When you get something like a positive slope or a negative slope, you may guess, besides magnetic ordering, should be some combination with paramagnetism or diamagnetism. So here, the positive slope means you have paramagnetism combined with ferro or ferry magnetism. If the slope was negative, you might guess, wow, some diamagnetism. Okay. For instance, if you take 
magnetite nanoparticles and encapsulate in polymer, especially polymer with a high concentration of benzene rings. You know, benzene rings, you have free electrons, pi electrons. And if you make a polymer like this one, like polyaniline, hmm? magnet nanoparticles encapsulate in polyaniline. The polyaniline is highly diamagnetic. And if you encapsulate magnetite inside, and if you measure magnetization, the hysteresis curve, you very likely will have your hysteresis curve, but going downward because of the diamagnetism of the polyanalyte, okay? You have to extract this, the contribution of paramagnetism and diamagnetism in order to fit your data. And see, look at this zoom of near the zero. You can see the zoom here, right? Okay. You can see that the coercive field on the positive side is not exactly the same as the coercive field on the left side. This is what people call exchange bias. Hmm? So your history is this curve, just move. This is exchange bias. You know? Exchange bias was a very important phenomenon discovered and understood by middle of 80s, 1985, 1986. And these days is a very hot topic, again. But before I move to the next slide, let me show you something interesting. When you work with nanomaterials, like a nanoparticle. You always have a kind of core shell structure because the shell, you know, the layer to atoms, thick layer. The atoms which are at the surface, they are not the same as the atoms which are on the core. They are different. As I told you, they are frustrated. They need some appointment with a psychiatric guy. Hmm? Why? Because the guys here, the atoms here, they look inside, they see translational symmetry. But they look outside and they see nothing. They look inside, is the heaven. They look outside, is the hell. There is a very famous statement in a very famous book of surface science. The guy wrote, when the God made the universe, at the end of the day, God kept to himself, or herself, I don't know, the book side, and gave the surface to the devil, because surface is so complicated. Hmm? So typical nanomaterials, they are always like this, core shell. How much is the core, how much is the shell? It depends on the shape, on the size, on the materials, on the preparation technique. But this is a good point to keep in mind. Well, if, this, if, the, if the shell is not exactly like the core, what about the interface between the two? Do they match perfectly? No. They have strain. Hmm? Stress. Okay? And then, when they have stress and, and strain, they may create exchange bias. This is strange, just shift sideways, you know, the history is this curve. And this phenomenon was very important in nanomaterials, very much 
Look at this paper. Oh, so bad. This is a physical review letter from 1986. The first author, his name is Mario Norberto Baibich. He's a friend of mine, a Brazilian, who is a professor in the south of Brazil. And he was in his postdoc in France. He measured this one, hmm? giant magneto resistance. He's the first author of this physical review letter. He took his data to his boss because he measured, you know, he fabricated this multi layers, iron and chromium. Hmm? Multi layers. He went to France because he figured that place he could fabricate this. Because at his place in Brazil, he had no facility to fabricate it. So, he went there to fabricate this and make the measurements. He designed the samples, he fabricated the samples, he measured this. Many times, he told me, he fabricated many samples, measured observed the same thing, he could not understand that one. <coughs> he took that to his boss. When his boss looked at the data, wow, this is something I was expecting. But I never saw it. Who was the boss? Albert Fert. Here. Because of this, he got the Nobel Prize in Physics. Though the first author got nothing. Hmm? That's science. Science is like this. Okay. Mario was not very much frustrated with this. We talk about this point many times. He said, no, no, it's okay. Who cares? It's a wise guy. Okay, now how you can model the hysteresis curves? Not easy. Not easy to model this. Uh, actually, the first tries to model was made by a German guy called Preschak. Early in the last century. He figured that it was very difficult to model hysteresis curves. Okay. So, we have been working on this and trying to model not only hysteresis curves like this one, but also trying to model the magnetic birefringence. Have you heard about magnetic birefringence? Well, you can measure magnetic birefringence. It scales somehow with magnetization. But the curve goes a little bit different. So magnetization you can describe using the first order Langevin function. Magnetic birefringence. You need the second order Langevin function. They look almost similar, but the details are different. I, I didn't include in my lectures this technique, you know, uh, magnetic birefringence, though it is interesting. Hmm? But you know. I have a time, limited time, I have to choose something. But I can keep talking to you every day like this for two months. I'm just sharing with you my experience. Okay, now, look at how we manage. So we describe magnetization as a composition of two components here. The first one goes linearly with the field. And the coefficient could be positive, and that is paramagnetism. Or it could be negative, and that is diamagnetism. So this first component makes your curve looking upwards or downward. Okay? If you manage it to extract this component out, then your curve will look like the typical hysteresis curve with saturation. Okay? Now, here is the component of the magnetic material, and you can see we wrote here three components. Let me explain to you. 
L is the Langevin function, this one. It typically describes superparamagnetism. Okay, I'll show you later on in this lectures, of course, or, or, or tutorials. So this is the first order Langevin function. And then the argument here, that's the argument, is the magnetic moment of the nanoparticles times the field over the thermal energy. This is standard. So we have three components here, magnetic components. The first one, this coefficient here, this component describes a single nanoparticle, okay? Isolated nanoparticle. And then Y is the fraction of that one. And those two components describe agglomerates of nanoparticles. But nanoparticles, they come together if they, they, if they are magnetic. They can build different clusters. Huh? The simplest one is the cluster with two nanoparticles. But when two nanoparticles come together, they can align the magnet moment like this. Or they can align like this. This gives you a different magnetization, different response. So this is the reason we include the dimers. We call dimers, dimers type A and dimers type B, which is called funny or coherent. Funny is like this coherence like that okay it gives you different free energy actually so using using this approximation here and then you know this is the argument of isolated nanoparticle but this is the argument of clusters what is the difference between one and another this one if you keep this coefficient equals to one and this is a contribution of the cluster. If there is no cluster, this is zero. And that is the internal field provided by the cluster. If there is no cluster, the internal field is zero. So if this is zero, this is run out, and this is one, and then you get this one. Okay? So this uh, argument describes clusters. But in real life, when you make a synthesis of nanomaterials, very hard to be monodispersed, a single shape and a single size. It's tough, very difficult, a very big challenge. Usually what you have is a particle size distribution. So this function, because, you know, Nanomaterials, they respond depending on the size and the shape. They respond differently. Okay, you have to, you need to average out your property as a function of size. Typically, this is a log normal distribution function. It's the most used function to describe uh, polydispersity in nanomaterials. Okay, if you take all this together and fit your data, look at that. Symbols are experimental. And the solid lines are the fitting. Very good fitting. Very good, I would say. So this model, uh, we have been working on this one, not only to explain magnetization, but also to explain magnetic birefringence. Very successful. Okay, now about still about magnetization. There are many ways to measure, you know, to design your experiment. But there are two one which are very much standard, <clears throat> and they are called zero field cooled and field cooled experiment. What that means? It means something like this. You take your sample, magnet, nano-sized, put in its sample holder, and go to measure in a VSM or a squid, it doesn't matter, or in a 
Faraday or Guy balance, any of these techniques, you put your sample there and you cool down your sample. You may cool down your sample with zero applied field. Hmm? Then you have a zero field coolant. Or you take your sample at room temperature, put in your sample holder, apply a field, and then cool it down. That's field cooled. This, the system response is very different. There is a range of temperature which they respond evenly, but there is a range of low temperature they are quite different. And you can see here, look at that. Up to this point, the same sample under zero field cool or field cool are exactly the same. But there is a point that these two curves just split. And one, you know, the field cooled keep going up until it saturates. But the zero field cooled get a maximum and then goes down. In reality, these data are not taken from here to there. The way you take the data, first you cool down your sample, and then you start warming your sample and measuring the magnetization. This is the way to take it experimentally. Okay? They are very different. Hmm? And this, what people call cusp, this maximum is the blocking temperature. It's not very hard to understand in your head, to make a model to understand this. Not very much. Think about this. You make a sample, like uh, iron nanoparticles. Let's say five nanometers in diameter, iron. And you are so good that you manage it to protect the surface, not allowing iron to oxidize, huh? because you are smart. Okay? And then you take those now particles and encapsulate inside a polymer. Hmm? Okay. Then take sample and put on your system. When you put the nanoparticles in your uh, polymer, they go into the polymer. Moments of those particles are randomly oriented. Okay. You encapsulate at zero field, and then they are randomly oriented. What we call easy axis, randomly oriented. You take this sample and cool it down without external magnetic field. So, the sample was cooled and the magnet moment were oriented along the easy axis and the easy axis were randomly oriented and then at the very low temperature as the magnet moment are randomly oriented what you should expect about the magnetization you measure zero near zero okay because they were, magnetization is a sum of vectors, zero. It's like this, this point here. Hmm? And then, <coughs> make all these measurements. See, you, you cool this down at uh, zero field, but to make the measurement, when you start warming up, you applied a field. In this case, just 100 first. Okay? Then you apply the field. When you apply this small field at this sample, the magnet moment try to align to the external field you applied. But the field is very small, and the temperature is very low. So, 
they don't respond, they try to respond, but not much. So your net magnetization is near zero. You keep the applied field and then start to warm up. As you warm up your sample, the magnet moment, they are able to align more and more and more because they can overcome the magnetoanisotropy barrier. Okay? We will talk about this later on. And then you, the, the warmer you go, the more they align until they get a ma maximum. Hmm? They don't go up forever. Once they are completely aligned, it's the end. And that is the point at the blocking temperature. If you warm more, now they are all aligned, but if you warm more your sample, you know what does? They shrink. The magnetization just reduces because magnetization reduces with the temperature. And then they come down. That's the explanation. You know? That's the mental model of this. Not very hard to understand. Okay. But there are different ways to model this. How you can model this? Usually, you can model this with classical statistics. You don't need quantum statistics to model this. So here is one way. You can model this looking at, here is the orientation. That's the magnet moment of the particle. This, this, this is the applied field. And this is the easy axis, which means without any field, the magnet moment aligns along the easy axis, which is the minimum of energy. And here is the energy. You can see the energy depends on the angle hmm? between the magnet moment and the easy axis, this angle here. But if you apply external field, the energy has an extra contribution to the energy, which is the interaction between the magnet moment and the applied field, m dot h, just this. Hmm? Typical interaction. M dot H. Okay? So this is the energy. This is the energy barrier. Wow. You can minimize the energy. This is to minimize the energy. You all know about this better than me. Hmm? And then you can extract which angle, <coughs> this angle, corresponds to the minimum of energy, okay? Now you can modulate your magnetization. Here is your magnetization. See? Magnetization is m dot h, right? And that is like this one. So you can model this one. Take the typical phase transition because you are warming up your sample. Eventually the magnetization goes down. So you combine all this together, calculate this average. Wow. I'm going to show you data about this sample. OK? This is, see, this bar is 50 nanometers. This sample average size is about 12 nanometers. This is iron nitride. And you can see how homogeneous this is. Amazing. This sample was synthesized by a friend of mine who lives in Berlin, a German guy, Norbert. Norbert Busk is his name. A very good chemist. So, and then we measure, you know, magnetization as a function of temperature in condition of zero field cooled. Huh? And this is the real curve we got. You can see. Symbols are experimental data, and a solid line is the fitting. Very nice fitting. Hmm? If, you take, if you take this approximation, the fitting there is quite nice. But this fitting requires that 
one important point requires that the anisotropy energy is not constant. It depends on the temperature. In actual, it does. Huh? So, to fit this data like this, this anisotropy energy needs to go down like that. Hmm? That's the fitting. Okay? Now you can model your data. Here is another case. Now it's uh, not iron nitride, but is a ferrite. Nickel ferrite, nanoparticle. Size, size, typically 10. And this is a curve fitting of particle size, which is a log normal, like I told you before. And then we can measure the magnetization versus temperature. Here is the magnetization at cube, third power, like this. In this case, this sample goes approximately like one third, which is typical of 3D systems. So, then we plot here the magnetization at power 3. It comes a straight line, which shows really it, it fits well this model. And then we can extract the transition temperature and the saturation magnetization. Okay, with this sample, we know how it behaves. And then we made zero field cooled. Those are zero field cooled at different fields. Symbols are experimental and solid lines are the fitting with that model. It fits nice. I mean, you can model your data and you can extract important information from this. Like for instance, you know, the blocking temperature, how it goes with the field. Well, it's very interesting to show that here is the uh, anisotropy of a bulk nickel ferrite. And here is the anisotropy we found for nanoparticles. Smaller. They go almost parallel, but anisotropy of nanoparticles are smaller. <coughs> Which means the barrier, the barrier, the anisotropy barrier of nanoparticles is smaller than the anisotropy barrier of bulk. From where does it come? It comes from the surface. The problem of the surface of nanoparticles. I mean, the spins at the surface, they are not well oriented as the core. So, the magnet moment of the core hmm, actually is size, actually. The magnetization of the shell is very close to zero, though the size is, you know, a big size. And then the core has a magnetization, which at the end, it is smaller than you expect for the big particle. So, at the end, you get the anisotropy smaller than the bulk. This is typical. Unless the shape, if you change the shape, the shape has a big contribution to the anisotropy, which is shape anisotropy, called shape anisotropy. Huh? There is a difference. If you make your sample like a sphere, there is an anisotropy constant for that one. If you take the same amount of material and make it like a strip, is the same material, the same amount. But the anisotropy of this guy is much higher than the anisotropy of this sphere. We call this shape anisotropy contribution. Okay? Oh, let me show this one. This is a recent paper we published. We managed to make something like this. Hmm? A core shell system. Gold, gold, in the middle. Very small, because we don't have that much money to make it big. Then we made it very small. And on top, we put magnetite, mm. core shell, gold and magnetite. Of course, you have an interface between the two. 
and the interface they don't match completely well well they might have some you might guess well what about the exchange bias can you see exchange bias in a system like this yeah we did okay now we made zero field cool and field cool experiments and then we can model like the other one it's a little bit different approach because here we are modeling the blocking temperature but also using a distribution function like log normal but now we are modeling not the magnetization but susceptibility magnetic susceptibility magnetic susceptibility is the derivative of magnetization as a function of field right so they are connected okay we could model this one both zero field and field cooled and you can see there is a contribution for unblocked nanoparticles unblocked means the range of temperature the two curves zero field and field cools they go together at high temperature above tb and blocked is below okay so we have different contributions for unblocked and blocked and then you can see for unblocked it goes at lower range of temperature from zero to tb okay and then blocked goes higher there so it depends on the range now here is the fitting well we use some uh, actually those are very standard way to describe you know the the coercive field and the exchange field but this is the coercive field the way we describe it so the coercive field goes with the effective anisotropy and then you can see the experimental data and the modeling Huh? it's a very you know very nice way to model uh, this uh, zero field and field cooled systems okay now so you can see the coercive field as a function of t the same way you can see the exchange field as a function of temperature as you increase the temperature the, the friction between the core and the shell reduces hmm? they strain and they stress just reduce okay so the coercive field change very change a lot actually as a function of t it goes roughly to zero as you cross 50k in this case and here is the amount of exchange field so the coercive field of this side is not exactly the coercive field of that side so this shift is the exchange field so typically core shell systems they do have exchange bias hmm? not only not only we are I, I have been talking all all this time about magnetic materials what that means you have spins which present long range ordering but Maxwell's equation is not only on magnetic field it's not only on magnetization it has to do also with polarization electric field you know we have materials which are we call ferroelectric materials electric moments can be aligned can be ordered at long range those are ferroelectric materials if you make ferroelectric materials like core shell at the interface they also present exchange bias very interesting it's not very much explored but they do present now they start paying very much attention to this why because people <coughs> are investigating more and more materials they call multi 
ferroics. Which are those materials that present long range magnetic order and long range electrical order in the same material? Okay, and then might have strong interaction between these two orders. And then they are called magnetoelectric materials, special class of multiferroids. Very important for technological applications. Hmm? Why? Because those magnetoelectric materials, you can modulate the electrical property changing the magnetic, magnetic field, or vice versa. You can modulate the magnetic properties just changing the electric field. Okay. Now, if you apply electric field, you can twist up and down spins. It's a way to make memories. Hmm? <laughs> it's a way to control memory, and vice versa. It is a very, you know, it is a a uh, huge investment these days on magnetoelectric materials because people are expecting to build new memory devices from this one. So exchange bias is already is also present in this kind of materials which are very very important. Well, I'm sorry I cross maybe 10 minutes over one hour but when people put a microphone on me hmm, like they did it's a, it's a problem my students used to say don't give this guy a microphone <laughs> I, I really thank you so much for coming here thank you but still if you have a question hmm, please go ahead and ask me and this was me years ago, huh? the time I was still doing some experiments. This was uh, in photoluminescence table, actually, optical table. Is there any question? Yeah. Now, if it is plotted between M versus B, it well, it is possible, of course. You can plot as a function of H or as a function of B. But you have to be careful to translate, you know, the, the, the units properly. But typically, what your uh, electromagnet gives you is H and transfer to B. Hmm? The curves will be about the same shape. Scale. Yeah, they scale one another, but they have a different, uh, let's say, inclination, a little bit different. So if you plot, let's say, magnetization versus B, you don't see the saturation. But if you plot as a function of H, you do you do see the saturation. This is why people plot as a function of H and not as a function of B, typically. <coughs> and the same is if you look at uh, ferroelectric materials, that's the same. So people plot as a function of E, polarization as a function of E and not as a function of B. I think everyone is. Oh, okay. Uh, what is the actual uh, reason behind the shifting of x axis? I do the force and shift by some. Oh, okay. What is behind this, right? What is the picture behind this? Well, <coughs> maybe I can try to. Wow.
Yeah. See, this is a typical behavior of a uh, exchange, a system that presents exchange bias. You can see magnetization versus field, and the cycle is just shift to the left, right? So you can see different orientations of the magnet moment. This is a bilayer. See, this is a, a layer, bilayer of ferromagnetic and anti-ferromagnetic materials. Hmm? Bilayer system. You know, like, like this one. Okay? Now, this picture wants to tell you what happens in different positions. See, when you apply external field in the direction of your ferromagnet is aligned, okay? So you increase this one and reduce this one, actually, the antiferromagnetic, okay? Now, you, you reduce the spin aligned against that one. So, at the end, the net field at interface is a sum of this and that one. When you apply on the other side, the net field at the interface is different from this one. So it comes because the net field, there is an interface, and there is a different magnet ordering on both sides. If you apply a field, they behave differently, and then the net magnetization at the interface is different. So the net magnetization is the one your system responds. Okay, so the net magnetization goes against the applied field and it shifts the curve. Typically, it's like this. This is the picture you can start with to understand the data. So it depends on the way the two sides align with the external field and how they do interact. Super power magnet? Super power magnet, yeah. Oh, what, what that means? Yeah, what that? Wow, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can quickly, because uh, we have a lecture on super power magnets, actually. Maybe yes. tomorrow or the day after yeah. tomorrow. I, I, I propose a specific lecture on super power magnets, and I'll be talking about that by probably more than one hour. Can I postpone the answer? To? Okay. <laughs> yeah, maybe you want to get your lunch. Yeah? Maybe, uh, having that model sitting you were talking about, will you be doing some tutorial on that model sitting? What? Which one? The model you suggested. Uh, uh -huh. Will you be doing some kind of tutorial on that? What kind? Extracting the data, the oh. magnetic layer or some paramagnetic layer and fitting the data. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's why when you model your data, hmm, what is the idea to model with data? Is to extract some important parameters from that one. Yeah, sure. Okay, let's go lunch. Thank you. <laughs>